Okay, I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Richard Openlander and uh, he will uh, have a presentation. So please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Grazie mille. Distinguished members of parliament and guests, ladies and gentlemen, knowing and doing. There's a very real and imminent threat to our existence that is not found in the headlines of the news because no one wants to talk about it. There's a bit of an awareness gap and no one's willing to step forward and manage it. The film Cowspiracy divulges the massive environmental damage attributed to animal agriculture, providing us with just a glimpse of the many shocking facts, figures, and ratios. Some of these numbers have changed slightly since the film was made, and I'd be happy to review those with you at some point in time later. The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite simple. It's terribly inefficient, wasting resources, energy, and lives. But what you see in Cowspiracy, the film, is just the very tip of the iceberg. What the film does not spell out are the critical timelines that confront us, as well as the most destructive, insidious constraints that prevent us from proper evolution, including pervasive misuse of the word sustainable itself. We humans have reached a crucial and fragile point in our evolutionary journey as a species. Just in the past hundred years, we've reached the Anthropocene era, where we've acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere the litho, hydro, and atmosphere. We're ruining the very environs that sustain us and all other life on Earth. We're in fact in overshoot mode, demanding more of our planet than what it can provide. It would take one and a half to two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. In the United States and right here in Belgium and with many other European countries, it would require four or more of our planets to sustain our current lifestyle. In fact, five out of nine planetary boundaries or tipping points of our life support systems on Earth have already been passed, five out of nine. And with the other four boundaries, we're exceeding their tolerance levels. And all nine boundaries are interconnected. As one collapses, the others will soon follow. Although climate change is taking front stage everywhere, especially in Paris this week, we must recognize that it is just one of the nine boundaries. There are few researchers and organizations who are quite aware of the dire predicament that we're in and the very short timelines that we're faced with. Any of these folks will bluntly tell you that our species is in a state of unsustainability and that we can't remain on this course for very much longer. But not one of them is connecting the final dot. They continue telling us that our survival is in peril and that we need to change. But change what? And they make it very clear that we need to stop overconsuming and overproducing. But overconsuming and overproducing what exactly? Energy and fossil fuels and waste are very easy targets for them to point their fingers at. But we now know that the single sector most responsible for nearly all aspects of our unsustainability combined, or what I call global depletion, is that of animal agriculture, the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. Let's take a close look at just a few of the many, many timelines that we're faced with. A 40% shortage in freshwater supplies predicted to occur in just the next 14 years. All topsoil predicted to be lost in the next 60 years. Phosphorus and nitrogen balance irreversibly altered today. Mass extinctions occurring daily. 87% of oceanic fish species are overexploited around the verge of collapse today. Nearly all commercially recognized fish expected to be extinct by the year 2048. And on and on. So we clearly need to quickly change our ecological footprint. We can blame overpopulation but are we really going to begin culling other humans? We can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but that'll take too long, and climate change is, again, just one of the planetary boundaries confronting us. We must remember that climate change is also an exacerbator. It takes matters and makes them worse. At the beginning of the sustainability equation is the word itself, sustainable, which is now seen everywhere, but this word is typically misused and it's ill-defined because rarely, if ever, is food choice properly positioned, especially the raising and eating of animals. Despite its enormous effect, it's simply too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially. This is the reason, though, that we're in a sustainability crisis today. As a global community, we have been too slow in realizing the state of unsustainability that we're in. We've been vastly too slow in making the connection to animal agriculture, and we've been indifferent to act. The future holds some troubling trends. 
The global human population is predicted to reach 9.6 billion by the year 2050, 2 billion more than we have today, with rising numbers and wealth of the middle class. And the demand for meat and dairy products is expected to double from where it is today. Over 3 billion tons of grain were produced last year in the world, but nearly half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. We can't blame, therefore, climate change, droughts, or flooding for the world's food security issues. Clearly, the problem is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the 900 million suffering from hunger or the growing human population, but rather where all the food globally being produced is going. The onus for this predicament lies with our leaders who have failed us in this regard, our business leaders, academic and funding institutions, civil society organizations, and our policymakers. Sustainable development has been on the international agenda for more than 25 years with vigorous talk about the economic, social, and ecological components, but in reality, only the economic aspect has been addressed at the detriment of our environment. Even with the new 17 sustainable development goals recently agreed upon, the effect of animal agriculture is not properly positioned, and we must understand that it is our environment that will ultimately sustain our species and society and be the parameter by which wealth is measured. These are just some of the many resource comparisons. You'll be able to pick up much more of these during the film. The formula for success in developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and for developed countries to follow, is to establish models of multi-dimensional sustainability that I've written about, established on many levels simultaneously with plant-based food systems at the nucleus. Education and international funding should use this as the platform for responsible lending, to then achieve the highest level of responsible, sustainable development. Today, we're floating around precariously in a zone or state that I call pseudo-sustainability, never getting to where we need to be, but thinking that we are sustainable. That's a very dangerous situation. And for anyone who believes that eating any animal product is sustainable, then it's time to understand the concept of optimal or optimal relative sustainability. That'll work. How sustainable is it to produce and consume any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods? Just during the past one hour, over 8 million domesticated land animals were slaughtered. Over 200 million sea animals were caught and killed for us to eat. And 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock we're still raising. But during that same one hour, over 350 children in the world died from starvation. These numbers should be zero. This then becomes a matter of ethics, doesn't it? It becomes a matter of social justice. The person sitting next to you who's eating a steak, pork, chicken, cheese, or fish is taking away the resources that could be spread more evenly, more efficiently, and used to support the life of perhaps 20 other people and thousands of other species while helping to mitigate climate change rather than causing it. The Living Planet Index shows that we lost more than half of all animal species in the world just in the last 40 years due to loss of habitat and degradation. Not surprisingly, during that same 40-year period of time, global production of meat and dairy products quadrupled. Instead of ignoring the effect of animal agriculture on climate change, the participants at COP21 in Paris should understand that there are working examples today showing complete mitigation of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions from all sources by way of sequestration simply by converting feed cropland and grazing livestock pastures to direct plant-based systems. So animal agriculture weaves its way recklessly through irreversible climate change, loss of land and fresh water, oceanic destruction, loss of biodiversity and rapid rate of extinctions, world hunger, pollution, food pricing and availability, increase in chronic and emerging diseases regarding our own human health, as well as policymaking and funding. Thus, animal agriculture blocks our evolution to a higher ground toward a healthier, more peaceful, and just planet. In terms of solutions, this is not a time for us to take baby steps or for us to go meatless only on Mondays because we are on very real timelines that extend beyond self into society and future societies, human and non-human life. We're all connected. Eating only local food will not solve the problem because it's not the size of the farm or the miles traveled that causes the problem. It's the type of food being produced. And despite what the United Nations and other gold standard organizations are promoting, this sustainability issue will not be solved simply by advocating eating less meat, which is 
subjective, inconsistent with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem, and perpetuates irresponsibility with every bite taken. And it mistakenly shifts the focus to seafood. Regarding our oceans, the damage we've done is irreversible in our lifetime. And today, there is no such thing as sustainable seafood, especially if you apply the three key factors of how that word sustainable is defined by the fishing industry itself. And contrary to what everyone would like to believe, raising grass-fed, organic, pastured livestock will not solve the problem either. It'll make matters worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, more methane produced, and a higher feed conversion ratio. It also must be clearly understood that this is not an industrial or a factory farm issue. It's a raising animals to eat issue. Farm to table and climate smart agriculture are new catchwords and terms, but these new food movements only make sense if you use our dwindling natural resources to grow plants for direct human consumption. We no longer have room for animals to be configured in the middle of the food production equation for humans. It's become antiquated. It's become obsolete. So how do we solve this? Over the years, I've been proposing two categories of solutions. First, there needs to be widespread sweeping education of the public and those with a platform of influence. We need to essentially educate the educated. And second, we need to implement initiatives based on that education, such as creating policies which open the doors for businesses and help new and also young farmers and help transition existing farms from animal agriculture to plant-based systems, beginning with the reallocation of the $500 billion per year we spend globally subsidizing the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. In her closing remarks at a recent climate change conference of the parties, the executive secretary of the conference, Christiana Figueres, provided a summary of the conclusions of 200 nations, NGOs, and researchers by stating this about our future, about greenhouse gas emissions, and about climate change. She said this, the science is unquestionable. Therefore, despite the obvious effects on the industry itself, we must call for the elimination of the use of coal as an energy source. And she said, we must do this immediately. Notice that she didn't say we should use less coal or for us to use only local or humane coal. In fact, she said we should eliminate coal, even though coal carries with it roughly the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions, slightly more, depending on who you're reading, than raising livestock does. And coal has no real direct effect on land use changes, water scarcity, world hunger, loss of biodiversity, and all other areas of global depletion, but raising and eating animals does. So the door has been opened hasn't it? For massive global food choice change. If there is an imminent threat to our planet and to us, which there is, well, we should certainly be able to call for its elimination and for it to be done immediately. Our generations of policymakers today are in a unique situation to help save Earth as we know it, save life on it now, and allow a livable future for those who inherit this planet from us. Or we could allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. But we have enough information in front of us to make the right decisions. And in doing so, we will be seen not just as good stewards, but as superheroes who stopped a runaway train with all of us on board and turned it into the direction of optimal sustainability before we went over that cliff. The future of humanity is very likely at stake. So you in this room represent our leaders, and you can make this happen. You can inspire others to make this happen, but we have to act today because time is running out. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. It's certainly a privilege for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you.